For now, let's get back to Newton. He explained the relationship between crash forces and inertia in his second law. And the way it's often expressed is F equals ma. The force F is what's needed to move the mass m with the acceleration a. Newton wrote it this way. It's the same thing. Acceleration is the rate at which the velocity changes. But if I multiply each side of the equation by t, I get force times time equals mass times a change in velocity. When Newton described the relationship between force and inertia, he actually spoke in terms of changing momentum with an impulse. What do these terms mean? Momentum is inertia in motion. Newton defined it as the quantity of motion. It's a product of an object's mass, its inertia, and its velocity or speed. Which has more momentum? An 80,000 pound big rig traveling two miles per hour? Or a 4,000 pound SUV traveling 40 miles per hour? The answer is they both have the same momentum. Here's the formula. P is for momentum. I don't know why they use P, they just do. Equals M is for mass and V is for velocity. P equals MV, that's momentum. And what is it that changes an object's momentum? It's called an impulse. It's the product of force and the time during which the force acts. Impulse equals force times time. Here's my favorite demonstration of impulse. I have two eggs, same mass. I'm going to try to throw each egg with the same velocity. That means they have the same momentum. If the impulses were equal, why do we have such dramatically different results? The wall applies a big stopping force over a short time. The sheet applies a smaller stopping force over a longer time period. My students say the sheet has more give to it. Both stop the egg, both decelerate the egg's momentum to zero, but it takes a smaller force to reduce the egg's momentum over a longer time. In fact, so much smaller that it doesn't even crack the egg's shell. Now let's relate this to automobiles. Both of these cars have the same mass, and both are traveling at the same speed, 30 miles per hour. Like the eggs, they have equal momenta. As a result, it will take equal impulses to reduce their momenta to zero. One car will stop by panic braking, and the other by normal braking. If both drivers are belted so they decelerate with their vehicles, the driver of the car on the bottom will experience more force than the driver on top. This is because if the impulses must be equal to decelerate each car's momentum to zero, the driver that stops in less time or distance must experience a larger force and the higher deceleration. A G is a standard unit of acceleration or deceleration. People often refer to Gs as forces, but they're not. Fighter pilots can feel as many as nine Gs when accelerating during extreme maneuvers and astronauts have felt as many as 11. People in serious car crashes experience even higher Gs, and this can cause injury. Now consider what happens when a car traveling 30 miles per hour hits a rigid wall, which shortens the stopping time or distance much more than panic braking. Let's again assume the driver is belted and decelerates with the passenger compartment. And let's also assume the car's front end crushes one foot with uniform deceleration of the passenger compartment throughout the crash. In this crash, the driver would experience 30 Gs. However, if the vehicle's front end was less stiff, so it crushed two feet instead of one, the deceleration would be cut in half to 15 Gs. This is because the crush distance, or the time the force is acting on the driver, is doubled. Extending the time of impact is the basis for many of the ideas about keeping people safe in crashes. It's the reason for airbags and crumple zones in the vehicles you drive. It's the reason for crash cushions and breakaway utility poles on our highway. And it's the answer to the question I posed at the beginning of this film. 
This driver survived the crash because his deceleration from high speed took place over a number of seconds. This driver decelerated in a small fraction of a second and experienced forces that are often unsurvivable. Up to now, we've been looking at single vehicle crashes, but if we look at two or more objects colliding, we have to use another one of Newton's laws to explain the result. Even though the first cars wouldn't appear on the roads for over 200 years, collisions were an active topic of physics research in Newton's day. Back in 1662, Newton and his buddies formed one of the first international science clubs. They call it the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge. One of the first experiments they did was to test Newton's theories on collisions using a device like this. What do you think is going to happen when I release this ball and it collides with the others? Let's try two. It's as if something about the collision is remembered or saved. Newton theorized that the total quantity of motion, which he called momentum, doesn't change. It's conserved. This became known as the law of conservation of momentum, and it's one of the cornerstone principles of modern physics. Before we apply this to crashing cars, we need to know something else about momentum. It has a directional property, so we call momentum a vector quantity. This means if identical cars traveling 30 miles per hour collide head on, their momenta cancel each other. Inside the passenger compartment of each car, the occupants would experience the same decelerations from 30 miles per hour to zero. The dynamics of this crash would be the same as a single vehicle crash into a rigid barrier. What conservation of momentum tells us about collisions of vehicles of different masses has important implications for the occupants of both the heavier and lighter vehicle. In a collision of two cars of unequal mass, the more massive car would drive the passenger compartment of the less massive car backward during the crash, causing a greater speed change in the lighter car than the heavier car. These different speed changes occur during the same time so the occupants of the lighter car would experience much higher accelerations, hence much higher forces than the occupant of the heavier car. This is one reason why lighter, smaller cars offer less protection to the occupants than larger, heavier cars. There's a difference between weight and size advantage in car crashes. Size helps you in all kinds of crashes. Weight is primarily an advantage in a crash with another vehicle. Newton was a pretty brilliant guy. The laws of motion he advanced over 300 years ago are still used today to explain the dynamics of modern day events like car crashes.